Mr. Chair, members of the board, Dr. Casey, thank you for having us this afternoon. Uh, we are here on behalf of Human <coughs> Services. I have with me Kiva Rogers, our Director of Social Services, and Megan O'Neill, the COO of the Greater Richmond YMCA. And we want to just give a child care update. We have no solutions for you on child care, but more to paint a broader picture and knowing that this will be an ongoing conversation that we have. So just to kind of kick this off, uh, we want to provide an update of what the child care landscape looks like for Chesterfield. And this is, if you do any kind of precursory research on Google, and even as this past year we participated in the ICMA Economic Mobility Grant, um, and two of the localities of the 10 were focused on child care throughout our nation, this is a nationwide problem that we're facing. The pandemic, in a way, broke child care by the amount of people that were involved by having centers, um, the staffing that it requires, the licensing that it requires, and then during the pandemic, how many kids that they were allowed to have in the space. And so we just haven't rebounded from that space. And so it is just, it's a continuing conversation of how it's funded and how do we create a pipeline for more people to open child care centers. And so a lot of what we're talking about today are just, it's to share information and how we are trying to address it here on a, a local level, knowing that it is a, a more <coughs> national and statewide issue. So you'll see in this picture, this was actually taken earlier this week and uh, Megan participated in this conversation. This was hosted with uh, Senator Warner and Mayor Stoney uh, with the YWCA and they had a focus on childcare with different providers. Um, our own Delilah Madrano also participated in this conversation. And one of the key topics that they brought up in this meeting was background checks, the access of making sure that employers can get background checks done quickly and also just not having a, univer a universal system even to talk from state to state. And so that is not something that our offices have heard complaints on. I think the complaints that we usually get are people looking for child care and looking for a solution. So within Chesterfield County, we have 114 providers. These providers run the gamut from an in-home center of somebody that's licensed to a center-based place uh, that may be a franchise operation or a larger operation or a faith-based center. And faith-based sometimes runs under dif different regulations. And then, of course, this affects multiple families. We don't know how many families aren't working or had to adjust what their lifestyle looks like because they don't have accessible childcare or childcare doesn't work for them. And we don't quite know what that number looks like for Chesterfield, and that's something we're trying to wrap our arms around and be able to better understand. And this also isn't a singular department issue. This is something that affects many departments. Um, we, you know, social services has a hand with the licensing and emergency management with the emergency action plans that each center is required to have, along with community engagement, just to keep a pulse on it, and economic development with the small business piece. So I'm going to hand it over to Kiva to talk more about what it looks like on the state level and some of the state initiatives that are happening. So um, thank you, Emily. <clears throat> I'll share a little bit about the kind of the landscape at a state level and then show what families in Chesterfield are experiencing. So recently, Governor Youngkin laid out a $444 million plan over the next biennium of how we're going to support the child care infrastructure in Virginia. Um, some pretty compelling data was used to really build the program to build the plan in a way that met some of our specific needs. Some of the data um, pieces that I wanted to highlight that I thought were um, critical because we're also seeing it locally is that there has definitely been um, identified a strong correlation between employment, the impact of having good quality child care, and the impact on the workforce. So essentially where there are child care options available, there's a positive impact on the employment rate within the community. And so <clears throat> what we found was that for children who are six and under, about two thirds, um, two out of three of those Virginia families, both of the parents, available parents, are in the workforce. And so that really shifts childcare from being a nice to have to really a necessity so that parents can 
really exercise the biggest uh, act of trust that uh, parents can do, which is putting their children in a care and educational setting, and our families are um, doing that. One of the things that really um, I thought is, was critical in this Building Blocks program is the emphasis on um, things being really parent and family driven. And so one of the cornerstones of this program is that funding becomes more flexible in the Building Blocks program where where we see the greatest need is where the funding goes. And so if there is funding that isn't being used in say a subsidy program, mm -hmm. that funding um, through efforts to kind of redefine how funding is used can then be applied to where parents' voice is saying, hey, we want this service. I thought a very, um, a very important um, piece that we'll see in, the, in my next slide is that two-thirds of Virginia families who are participating in a publicly funded early childhood system, they're choosing to um, participate in a public-private partnership kind of early learning program. And so this Building Blocks uh, initiative really builds on that and allows, you know, just greater flexibility. Uh, one of the, well, I'll identify two uh, pieces of the Building Blocks program that our families in Chesterfield um, are going to significantly benefit from. One is this investment maintains the current service level for our kids who are receiving child uh, care subsidy. This graph shows the trajectory of subsidy since FY19, where initially, I, I have on glasses and I cannot read that, so I'm gonna have to look right here. That's bad. Um, but where we, you see that we started with 536 families and where we are as of FY23, um, and so there has been a significant demand for services, families becoming eligible, um, something that, and Dr. Casey probably is writing this down, but I am going to look at the employment rate during these times, and I'm sure we will see here locally the same thing that they found on a, a state level, is where you'll see employment increasing, also the people accessing childcare um, as well. And so that was one of the things I wanted to highlight because the Building Blocks uh, program does sustain funding, where no one loses funding. Uh, we were at risk of losing the current level of funding uh, because of pandemic funding running out, but this uh, Building Blocks plan does maintain uh, funding. Another aspect of the Building Blocks program that we will benefit from is a focus on that early childhood age range that a lot of you probably have heard the Birth to Five initiatives, where this plan looks to really prioritize that age group. And for us in FY23, 63% of our kids who were using childcare subsidy were in that infant toddler preschool range. And so those are gonna be kids who um, are going to benefit from these additional services. I'm going to turn it over to Emily, who's gonna do a fun internet activity search um, to show you kind of what uh, families can do when they're looking to uh, select and identify um, child care programs, really empowering families with knowledge about the resources available. Okay, I do think it's valuable. This website is on, it's on our Chesterfield County website under community engagement and resources. And I, I think it's a valuable lesson to kind of walk through it so people can find child care in a way that works best for them. So this website is run by the Virginia Department of Education, and it's the most comprehensive website to find child care resources that is a location that's close to you and what kind of quality and what kind of service that you may need that may work best for your family. And so it's really simple of just to find a child care website, and then you just go and then, and then once you hit that search, it comes up, and you can, um, you can query through, we, I just put it all of Chesterfield, and if you want a day center or something, a, a religious-based child care center, everything that's in Chesterfield County comes up. And then you can pick off of that list and be able to click on it, and then it comes up if 
where the location is, so you can Google map it, and it also tells you when they got their license. But something that's also really important, it tells you about if there is violations in the center. And I always say it's worthwhile clicking on those violations to see if that's something that you can stomach as a parent, that you're, you're okay with. Some of these violations can be very, very benign, such as they don't have a landline phone because they've moved to cell phones. And so some of those updates that just maybe aren't with modern times. So I highly recommend clicking on those violations for families to be able to see if that's something that they want to know. But this is the most comprehensive website that we have that we try to draw people to because you really can pick all of the information and all of the things that matter to you when you're looking for the best place for your child. What populates that data? Is it their license? Yes. yes. So yep. if there's another facility but it's not licensed through the state, then it wouldn't show up here, but anybody licensed shows up? Is that how Anybody it licensed and anybody that is faith-based. So faith-based requires a different licensure. Right, or voluntarily registered. Any, anyone who is within the tracking system, I'll say, they would show up on here. I, I'm just asking if there's legitimate people that could be outside of this that we can put the word out to that they need to get to, to self-report yes. to this to be able to be considered. That was yes. where I was going with yes. it. Absolutely. This doesn't pick up if you have the, the lady three doors down in the neighborhood that might watch some neighborhood yes. kids and, mm -hmm. you know, it's word of mouth, you know, that is not included on this. This is all vetted information. Okay, and so then this coming Saturday, one of the solutions that we have, you know, when we talk about this is we need more, more child care providers. And so our workforce development partnership coordinator, Jackie Carter, she's here in our audience. She has worked really hard over the past several months to put together a workshop in partnership with Bryant Stratton College. And this comes with a whole committee of, from economic development and social, the team from social services. Um, that Jackie has led and what this event will be is it's at Brighton Stratton for people who are interested in becoming child care providers if they want to work at a center we have nine different providers who are actually hiring the day of mm -hmm. and then we have also if you want to start your own business we have um, workshops that people can learn how to start their own business what does licensure look like how would you be able to get financing to do that so we think it's re a really exciting event that we have planned we have 62 participants signed up um, we have 21 vendors for people to learn more about it um, and 24 of those 62 participants are interested in how to start their own child care center so hopefully this will, this will be something that's successful and that we'll be able to repeat. And again, we're able to do this. This is our last installment of that economic mobility grant that we received. So again, you know, thank you to Jackie for working to set this up. So next, kind of in the, in the child care realm, and Kiva touched on it too, that zero to five is the most brain development for our, our youngest population. And so working with libraries, community engagement and resources, and social services, we are creating with IST an early childhood dashboard. And so this dashboard, the purpose is to be able to see through census block data, uh, through PALS data and SOL data, what are our test scores look like from that zero to five and the first opportunity we have to test a kid, are they getting the resources that they need? Is it through lack of childcare? Is it through lack of community engagement or library resources? And so we want to find some data-driven results so we can start making an impact in areas that may have some lower, lower scores than we would like to see and be able to see how we can help our, our young, youngest residents in the community. And so this dashboard, we're currently just in the preliminary stages of kickoff, and we hope to have it done by later on this year. And we're really excited about what kind of data that this can provide to make some good uh, decisions and moving forward. And I uh, want to highlight our child care campaign. You may recall hearing about this back in 2022, which was an initiative that we did during the pandemic to just inform. We targeted parents, employers, folks who wanted to become child care providers, we are working with uh, constituent and media services to relaunch this. The different way that we're doing it this time is that the last effort was very short term, 90 day, 
kind of um, <clears throat> plan. This one is year long. We are going to um, infuse throughout the year just information about child care. We know, like uh, Mr. Engel just mentioned, you know, there may be folks who are caring for kids that aren't connected through the system and may be missing out on some resources such as training or, you know, other incentives that can help and to make sure that all families know about all of the resources that are available. And so this campaign really is just to increase public awareness across the spectrum of everybody who is impacted and influenced. Um, it started on January 15th. Um, there, some of the topics are about uh, financial assistance, how to become a child care provider, how to find child care services, um, just different things to, to speak to different audiences. And so we're really excited about that because we've updated all of our um, advertisements um, and work really hard with uh, constituent media services to widen our platform, um, pursue different opportunities to uh, communicate. We also did a podcast in 2022, so we're working on re-airing that, um, possibly doing another one that has more up-to-date information if anything has changed. So. Again, we're just trying to get the information out to share with the community. Mm -hmm. uh, I am getting ready to turn it over to Megan, mm -hmm. who is one of our partners at the YMCA. She's the Chief Operating Officer, and she's gonna talk a little bit about it from the child care perspective. Sure, thank you. Um, so Emily asked me if I could just give you a bit of a landscape of what the Y is doing in Chesterfield County. And if you could see um, from this that we are currently serving 867 students in the county. At, at these schools listed up on the screen. If you could go to the next, oh, thank you. you. Sure, okay. thanks. Um, in that, we also are, are busing from schools to our, our sites, and we serve 27 additional schools in that, and this is just a, a makeup of, of where we're picking up from and where we're busing to, if you could go to the next slide as well. So as you can see, we have a robust footprint uh, of transportation that we're taking the kids to and from. Um, we do the same during, during the summertime with day camp that we, we at our Camp Thunderbird serve over 400 kids on a daily basis um, as well in that respect. And then, and then all of our, our sites have camps that will range anywhere from 80 to 160 kids per day at those particular locations. Um, so Emily said, you know, uh, coming out of COVID, can you talk just a little bit about what we are seeing as a provider? And um, in this case, Misery doesn't like company because it's been tough. It's been tough for wise across the country um, and also for additional childcare providers and that hiring. Um, although in the last eight or nine months, uh, we have seen a bit of an opening in hiring staff. We are getting more people applying for, for jobs, more qualified people applying for work. And so um, that's, been, that's been hugely helpful. Um, as well as one of the things that continues to be um, a, a block is licensing and the requirements for that. And I could spend all day here talking, talking to you about that, but they're, um, they're, the issue with that is um, that that's a huge barrier for people that are not used to um, having to do paperwork and or have issues with technology or don't have that accessible to get what is required done in order for your child to be in our program, regardless of the funding piece of it, that becomes the first barrier. And we see that significantly in the city of Richmond, where we're at three schools that have the greatest need, and we're ranging anywhere from seven to 22 kids. Um, a lot of grandparents are supporting these grandchildren and when you talk about the technology piece of it in, in putting paperwork and getting the necessary paperwork, they, they back out from that point and say, and say no thank you. Um, if you could just go back, yes. And then again, the continuing parents change, we have not seen a flattening of the effects of COVID and people working. Uh, people's schedules are still either hybrid or their schedules continue to adjust, which makes their need for childcare um, fluctuating all the time with that. So we're trying to see how do we provide programs and services that um, have some adjustability to them so that it's not just a plug and play and that it's more of an a la carte um, offering to that. Um, you know, just the last thing that, that we do in Chesterfield County as well with great partnerships with the school is our Learn to Swim program. 
Um, this is something that we uh, love. We firmly and strongly believe that every child should not only be exposed to water, but be safe in and around water. And so um, we first and foremost serve Title I schools, and we will continue um, in Chesterfield County until we're able to serve all the schools that require that need and attention. So. Um, one of the things just I thought was interesting at Senator Warner's um, thing the other day, he talked about in the Commonwealth the lack of, of early education specifically, and, and he mentioned if things continue, there's going to be about 2,800 jobs lost, um, almost 89,000 preschool children that will not have service um, in, in early education. Um, there's a threat of about 1,400 centers, again, in the Commonwealth closing um, either due to lack of funding uh, or lack of support, um, and about uh, $280 million worth of lost revenue if parents are not able to provide care for their kids so that they can get back to work, which I thought was inter interesting statistics. Yes, very interesting. Uh, questions, comments, board members? Just a really quick question. You were saying, thank you, Mr. Chair, um, you said lack of funding, lack of support. Mm -hmm. And I was curious about when you mean lack of support, what do you mean? Um, so so f the lack of support for me would be just in terms of what are we doing to aid families through the issue of getting your child registered in, in a licensed program. Mm -hmm. Again, um, technology is a huge piece of that and I can't underscore it. Um, we will do pop-up events where we'll bring laptops um, to a school and parents will come and we can sit down with them but it's still not getting people through the system a lot of times they will open it up and see what the requirements are and not even come and ask and ask for help now we are all about the rigors of safety for children um, but that front end piece of it is is a barrier to access so with the program that you were showing before for finding them, so you're saying that's probably a part of the barrier also is that they can't even utilize it because they don't have a computer to find, unless they go to like a library or something like that. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. That's a problem. Yeah, I, I think the easiest, for me, the easiest solution would be if, if licensing would take a stance that says, if your child is enrolled in a public school, they have all the paperwork that is needed, but it's very duplicative if we, are asking them to go back to, you know, their um, doctors and get those forms resent. They just transportation then becomes an issue as well. That's very interesting because with dogs, you can have your your provider <laughs> at Holiday Barn yeah. email your vet and they will send the, the vet records to them That's for right. that. So why That's is right. that not okay? Sorry. So some of it's some of it's HIPAA compliant, but but in that paperwork, if you can get a, a sheet that says I authorize information sharing with these mm -hmm. vendors, mm -hmm. don't get me started either. <laughs> 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 Have you found that um, maybe there's something that needs to be done at state level for a code to, for some bill to be written that says that? Um, schools with permission from the parent can um, share this information with the third party um, once permission from the parent is obtained or something yeah. like that that would s allow us to so th this. there is a bill right now and we have um, a couple lobbyists who are lobbying on behalf of this um, that uh, suggest either a rewrite of licensing that sounds harsher than, than I, I mean it to but um, allowing providers to be exempt, um, which, which will cause you to have drop-in programs. Um, so yes, it's, it's, there's a bill right now being worked through. Thank you. Excellent, very good. Any other comments or questions? Dr. Casey. Just uh, one, you know, as you can tell, this is a topic that's not just a one and done presentation to the board, and, and we've really been vested in this topic at the very beginning of COVID, if you remember, because of the rules and spatial requirements that our childcare facilities had to really operate half full, uh, no more than that. And, and again, the business models of them and, and just the finding of staff were all constraints. But if you recall, as a, as a county, you know, with, with what discretion we had with some of the federal funds we got, we helped work out a business model with many of the childcare providers of really covering the costs or revenue streams 
of the half that, that weren't consuming the space. Mm -hmm. And we did that as long as we could with the federal funds that we had. We didn't have to necessarily go that route, but we were one of the first and, and leaders in trying to, to define how to keep this business alive. But there are many localities throughout the Commonwealth that actually had their child cares close up during COVID and, and have not returned. So uh, we're not, but again, as you can hear today, there's so much to do and much information. And, and again, uh, even Mr. Engel suggested, and I concur, you know, it's not just the county's promotion out to citizens. We're, we're going to try and do as best we can with uh, the Chamber of Commerce and other, other partners for their awareness of, of both sides of the equation. They need the, the child care for their workers and, and promote out manners in which child care can be done. Yeah. And the Y has started getting back into early education, knowing that there's, there's such a tremendous need for that. So we have a center at Life Church, um, which is in the county, and Liberation Church, which is in the city. So at Life Church, there are 27, 28 kids registered there right now. Um, and at Liberation, it's half of that. Just, and again, transportation and paperwork is the issue. Thank you so very much for being here. I appreciate your sharing on this topic because, as you noted, this topic is very much related to employment as well as the child learning and being safe and well taken care of. Thank you all for this update. Let's continue to focus on this and look for resources available to assist us, to assist you at the Y and other providers as well. But thank you all for what you all do.